Good evening and welcome to our colloquium this evening uh, that we have an opportunity to have this uh, special event over from tonight to tomorrow. Uh, so welcome. Uh, if you have any questions, I've got a few housekeeping matters to handle before we go any farther. Our whole conference and will be here in this room, uh, all of our panels and that sort of thing. If you look at the back of your name tag, we've got a schedule on it. Uh, so that's also for your convenience, as well as the flyers out front. Um, we've, got a, we've got the schedule on the back of that. If you are visiting Grand Rapids and you have some questions or um, need some assistance, please feel free to touch base with me or someone else. And uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our different sponsors who have made this event possible. Um, PRTS, obviously, for the facilities and the staffing that's helped put this event on, as well as to Calvin Seminary for some of the funding that's um, enabled this. And also to all of the institutions represented here by the, that have allowed uh, our speakers to, to be here um, in various capacities. So with that, um, thank you, and it's good to see you here. And uh, we look forward to having this conversation over the next couple of days. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, let Dr. Muller introduce our speaker tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you, Todd. I'd also like to welcome all of you here to a conference for the, to celebrate the publication of the English-Latin version of the Synopsis Purioris Theologiae. Um, if you are looking for pure theology and like to dispute, this is the conference for you. Um, I'd like to introduce as our first speaker, uh, Professor Keith Stanglin, who is Associate Professor of Historical Theology at Austin Graduate School in Austin, Texas. Um, he's the editor of the journal Christian Studies and the faculty blog there. He's coordinator of the Master of Arts program. He has written or edited seven books and many scholarly and popular articles. The books include Arminius and the, on the Assurance of Salvation, Brill, 2007. Arminius, Arminianism in Europe, an edited volume that he co-edited, Brill, 2009. The Missing Public Disputations of Jacobus Arminius, Brill, 2010. Jacob Arminius, Theologian of Grace, Oxford, 2012. Um, edited volume, Reconsidering Arminius, Beyond the Reformed and Wesleyan Divide, Abingdon, 2014. And the Reformation to the Modern Church in, from Fortress, 2014. Um, welcome, Keith Stanglin, and, and please. Well, thanks to uh, Richard for those uh, for the introduction, for the uh, invitation to come here and speak uh, tonight. Um, I wrote to Jay Collier um, maybe seems like three or four weeks ago <coughs> to ask uh, how long the presentation should be, whether I was thinking 20 or 30 minutes. And uh, he wrote back and said, somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour, and then leave some time for questions. Uh, so I was a little worried about that, but now that I look um, at what I have before me, I will try to keep it at under an hour, or maybe just exclude the opportunity for questions. Um, that's a joke, okay. Um, but I'll get right into it. We're here to examine the synopsis Purioris Theologiae and in studying it to recognize its significance, and perhaps to many, its orthodox content. The significance of the synopsis, writes G.P. von Itterzon, should not be underestimated. Christian Sepp, the Anabaptist preacher, declared, truly this synopsis is an excellent book. Others have been less effusive in their praise of the synopsis. In 1646, the remonstrant professor of theology, Etienne de Courcel, introduced readers to the collected Leiden disputations of his recently deceased predecessor, Simon Episcopius. In the course of his introduction, he finds it appropriate to compare Episcopius disputations with those found in a popular handbook of reformed disputations. He writes, quote, truly if it pleases one to compare the synopsis Purioris Theologiae promulgated after some years by the professors substituted in Episcopius' place, with these disputations of Episcopius, it would not be difficult to demonstrate that the title of purity in which it boasts is much more correctly appropriate to them." End quote. 
De Courcelles' rare but typical Arminian assessment of the synopsis is predictable. In comparison, Episcopius' pre-Dort Leiden disputations are actually purer. What is more interesting, though, is de Courcelles' assumption that is implied by the handbook's very title, namely, that there is a noticeable, easily demonstrable difference between pre- and post-Dort Leiden disputations. Although he insists that it would not be difficult to demonstrate, nevertheless, de Courcelles does not bother to demonstrate exactly how Episcopius disputations are purer than those of the synopsis, or conversely, how the synopsis might be less pure. It's my aim, therefore, to examine this assumption shared by both parties that there is a difference in these sets of disputations. Just how much purer is the synopsis purioris theologiae than the disputations of its pre-Dort predecessors? In order to do justice to this central question, it's necessary first to set the context and provide an overview of the synopsis and its forerunners at Leiden with which the comparison is to be made. So first, on this new Leiden reiteration. The Synopsis Purioris Theologiae is a, is a gathering of 52 disputations composed and conducted under the, the presiding of the four professors of theology at Leiden University, Johannes Polyander, Andreas Rivetus, Antonius Wallaeus, and Antonius Thusius. This collection, first published in 1625, comes on the heels of the Synod of Dort and represents a unified, reformed voice on the chief points of theological instruction. The immediate significance of the compilation is reflected in its four subsequent 17th century printings. Revived interest is reflected in the publication of its sixth edition in 1881, its later translation into Dutch, as well as the Latin and English edition currently in progress. The synopsis has been recognized as an important source in Dutch Reformed dogmatics and in more recent historical theology. It's important first to understand the genre of the synopsis as a collection of disputations. Disputations were an essential part of the curriculum in medieval and early modern universities. Centered around a contested or contestable topic or quaesio, the disputation included the proposition of theses to be defended against objections with appeals to recognized canons of authority. They were characterized by precise definitions that were then elaborated by a typically scholastic order of questioning and frequently by the use of Aristotelian causality. The disputations were conducted orally in the university setting, though they were recorded by amanuenses or later the propositions were printed prior to the oral disputation. In Leiden, the theology professors oversaw private and public disputations. So private disputations were for the private instruction of students outside the walls of the university, sometimes in a professor's home. Public disputations were either pro gradu or practice. A pro gradu disputation was composed and defended by the student who was to be granted a degree. But the more common type of public disputation was the practice disputation, which in the case of Leiden's Theological Staten College was composed by the professor and defended orally by a student. Public practice disputations came in two types. There was the quadlibital and those that were part of a collegium. On the one hand, the quadlibital practice disputations consisted of ad hoc topics outside of any set order. In Leiden, these disputations typically went by the title Theses Theologicae. On the other hand, the practice disputations conducted within a particular collegium were part of a determined order or integral series of topics. For an example, the regent of the Staten College, Johannes Kuklinus, conducted a series of disputations that proceeded in order through the questions and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism. Individual disputations came to be collected into books of their own. Since the medieval period, it was not unusual to collect the disputations of a certain author in order to represent that author's thought. For example, Peter Lombard's sentences or Thomas Aquinas Summa Theologiae are simply ordered series of disputed questions. Johannes Cochlinus' disputations on the Catechism were collected and printed as a sort of commentary on the Catechism. Conrad Forstius' infamous Tractatus de Deo was a collection of ten disputations on theology proper that he conducted at Steinfurt. Twenty-four of Jacob Arminius' public disputations were collected and published just before his death and they were later expanded and then appended with a collection of his private disputations, 
Often these collections served as the basis for a particular figure's systematic theology, or in the absence of such a treatise, they are the best indication of that writer's fuller theology. As a genre frequently neglected by libraries, those printed disputations that were not collected fairly immediately and reprinted sometimes did not survive. In addition to collections of disputations that rep represented a single author, there was precedent for the collections of disputations from a particular theological faculty. For example, the disputations from Geneva under the presiding of Theodore Beza and Antonius Fias were collected. Geneva was an obviously famous and influential school, which accounts for the publication of its disputations and its early translation into English. In the wake of the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the formidable attack on Protestant theology, Protestant universities increasingly became centers for the intellectual defense of the Reformed faith. So in addition to the treatises of individual professors, disputation collections made the content of Protestant theology um, and academic theology more widely available. So to the Leiden collections. In 1596, the Leiden Theological Faculty began holding a collegium of disputations that, in the span of a year and a half, would take students through the chief points of theology in 36 disputations, beginning with theological principia and concluding with the role of the magistracy. The disputations were composed and overseen in order of faculty seniority. So Franciscus Junius, Lucas Trelcatius the Elder, and Franciscus Homaris. This pedagogical practice set the precedent for the Leiden theologi theological curriculum for the next 13 years. For this original cycle of disputations would be repeated with some variation in content five times between 1597 and 1609. Due to two faculty deaths and their replacements in the midst of the third repetition, in 1603 the faculty order of presiding became Homaris, Arminius, and Lucas Trelcatius the Younger until Trelcatius' death in 1607, and then Arminius in 1609, when the fifth and final repetition abruptly ended in midstream. Leiden University, the first university in the Northern Netherlands, was founded as a Protestant bastion of freedom, and as such housed the flagship theological college in the region. So it's not surprising that there would be intense interest in the United Provinces and beyond in the work of Leiden's theological faculty. The Leiden faculty anticipated that there might be ongoing interest in these cycles of disputations beyond the oral events. In fact, they planned for each repetition to stand alone as an example of Leiden theology. This intention is most clearly seen in the pagination of the individual printed disputations. Beginning with the first repetition, the separately printed quarto-sized pamphlets of each disputation in the cycle were paginated consecutively in expectation not simply of eventual reprinting but of literally immediately binding together in one volume upon completion the disputation in each cycle. In other words, it was intended that these five repeated cycles of disputations, each conducted over the course of a one to three year period, would each be gathered to form a handbook of Leiden theology. Examples of these bindings appear at the Leiden University Library and at Trinity College Dublin, at least in those places. Due most likely to the scarcity of the original disputations and the difficulty of finding a complete set to bind together, two complete cycles were later reprinted and published with new pagination. The first repetition, representing the disputations of Junius, Trelcatius Sr., and Homaris, was published in 1611. And the fourth repetition, the Syntagma, represents the disputations of Homaris, Arminius, and Trelcatius Jr., was published in 1615. In this latter case, the printer acknowledges Im imitating similar examples of republication of disputations at Geneva under Beza and Fias, at Sedan under Daniel Tillinus, and at Heidelberg under David Piraeus. The printer of the fourth repetition planned also to publish the fifth and final and incomplete repetition, though this was never done. From the earliest days then, each cycle of theological disputations in Leiden was intended to cohere together as a sort of handbook of theology. The cycle topics and order were established in advance, and the professors took their turn as they went through the topics. 
In many cases, a disputation in the repu repetition would begin with a prefatory remark about the order, explaining why this topic is now being treated in this position after the preceding topics. Each disputation in the cycle was part of a larger whole. With this background in mind, it's easier to understand the genre of the synopsis and the expectations for the collection. In the Leiden tradition, the disputation topics of this post-Dort cycle were predetermined by the faculty, and then they rotated under the presiding of at first three professors of theology and eventually four. That is, the faculty evidently consulted with one another and proposed the topics in their order before each repetition began. The same is true before Dort. Um, a couple of quotes here, the first one from Gerard Brandt. He noted that in 1604, Humaris' disputation on predestination was, quote, out of his turn and contrary to the method that had been before agreed upon. It's implied there that the faculty sat down to select and order the topics for disputation before the repetition began. Concerning the third repetition in which Arminius 16.4 disputation on predestination appeared, the younger Brandt explicitly says that, quote, the professors of theology had entered into a mutual arrangement as to the order and succession in which the disputations were to be held, and the lot had fallen to Arminius to dispute on the subject of predestination. I'm not sure if Casper intended a joke there, but it's sort of funny. Thus, it's certain that the faculty agreed on the cycle of disputation topics to be covered in a given cycle. As with previous cycles, the primary immediate purpose of the synopsis cycle was pedagogical for the doctrinal training of reformed ministers. Since previous Leiden cycles had also been intended for gathering and publication, it's difficult to imagine that the new professors from the beginning of the process were not also attuned to the secondary, more remote purpose of forming a new handbook of theology. The handbook is, by its very nature, multi-authored, with each disputation on the one hand reflecting the individual thought of its author, and on the other hand expressing the unified thought of this post-Dort faculty. Unlike the previous five cycles, which were viewed as repetitions of the original cycle, the disputations behind the synopsis were intended as a new cycle, and one that would be followed later with new repetitions. So, all that and enough for background. And now for the main research question. In light of the fact that the synopsis was conceived and executed as a new iteration of an older practice of light and disputation cycles, and in light of its self-proclaimed pure theology, in what sense does the synopsis actually represent a pure theology? How much purer is it than its predecessors? So this is our central question. When I refer to the question, it's this. If you forget what the question is, look at the back of your name tag here. It's the very first thing there. One assessment of the impurity of the synopsis comes from B.J. Vandervault, who wrote that the synopsis, quote, does not succeed in being pure. That is, if one should use pure in the sense of being in accordance with the Word of God, the theology of the synopsis is not radically biblical because the philosophy underlying it is not pure. A scripturally bound philosophy is able to reveal many unbiblical points of departure in the theological system of the synopsis, end quote. With no attention to the meaning of the comparative adjective, Van der Waals evaluation is based only on his own view of what is biblical, such responses, therefore, do not really answer our question. Another opinion is that of Dick Roussel, cited earlier, who is representative of the remonstrance in judging the synopsis to be less pure than the disputations of Episcopius held at Leiden. Dick Roussel comes closer to answering our question because he does respect the comparison, specifically assuming a difference between pre- and post-Dort disputations at Leiden. Unfortunately, as stated earlier, he does not reveal where those differences lie. So my aim now is not to make a dogmatic assessment of the synopsis. All Calvinists here may breathe a sigh of relief, okay? And one may laugh, okay. Um, <coughs> rather, when I use the language uh, of the synopsis and ask whether it is pure, I mean to ask merely the historical question of whether it is different and how it is different from previous iterations of Leiden theological cycles.
I'll analyze what the authors themselves suggest about the comparison, if time allows, uh, what one later theologian has suggested, and then examine the disputations themselves before stating the conclusion. So first, statements within the synopsis itself. The claim regarding the difference lies first and immediately within the title itself. This is a synopsis of pure theology. In what way it is pure is not explicitly stated in the book's preface, but it is implied. Addressed by the authors to the Dutch magistrates, the preface first recalls the strength displayed in the revolt against Span uh, Spanish Catholic aggression towards state and church. It later mentions the founding of the university and the subsequent, quote, weeds of heterodox opinions that some among us had disseminated. Since the Roman Catholics had never infiltrated the theology faculty, the sowing of weeds must be a reference to the Leiden theology professors Arminius and Episcopius, and perhaps also to Forcius, who was briefly appointed in Arminius' place and dismissed before fulfilling any official professorial duties. The preface then thanks the magistrates for their support of Orthodox theology and its restoration at the Synod of Dort. They are praised for helping the seminary through the dangerous storms for which this synopsis of pure theology is offered in gratitude. With these prefatory comments, it's clear that Leiden University is the primary context and that the authors intend purer as a comparison between their Leiden theology and the Leiden theology before Dort. Hermann Bavink agrees that the synopsis is intended as a post-Dort theology after the expulsion of the Arminian plea and of heterodox thought from the Reformed Church. Furthermore, von Itterzon concurs that the book is intended to reflect a, quote, purified Leiden University that takes into account the results of Dort. The fact that Dort is the line of demarcation between more and less pure should serve to, to narrow the scope of the differences in the field of comparison. Although the issues treated in the canons of Dort may affect many areas of theology, the five heads of doctrine and closely related points are where we should focus our attention in answering our question. In other words, we should not expect to find the sharpest differences in, for example, Disputation 3 on the canonical and apocryphal books, or in Disputation 26 on the Office of Christ. However, when searching through the more typical places, that is, in topics that were contested between remonstrance and contra-remonstrance, uh, the synopsis still does not offer much clear help in discerning the differences. In fact, for a book whose very title indicates a polemic against the thought of Arminius and Episcopius, there is a startling lack of polemic against remonstrantism. It's not that the new Leiden faculty was sympathetic to the remonstrance or their theology, it was not. After all, in 1626, the four Leiden professors collaborated again in a lengthy 333-page censure of the 80-page Remonstrant Confession of 1621. In the 1626 censure, the Leiden faculty took time to disagree with most points of the Remonstrant Confession, from the topic of scripture to the topic of synods. One cannot help but wonder if this censure, published five years after the Remonstrant Confession, but only one year after the synopsis is a sort of self-correction to the moderation and the inattention to the remonstrance in the 1625 synopsis, making up in some ways for being, being too friendly in the synopsis. At any rate, in the synopsis, the remonstrants are never mentioned. The only mention of the Synod of Dort comes in the conclusion of Disputation 17 on free choice, when the error of the semi-Pelagians is rejected with brief supporting quotations, not from Arminius or Episcopius, but from John Cassian and Faustus. On the face of it, it's difficult to agree fully with Bavinck's claim that the synopsis, quote, exposes and pursues controversies with remonstrance in papists acutely, accurately, and perspicuously. One could equally argue that even if the positive doctrines are plain, the controversies with remonstrance are not exposed and pursued clearly at all. As it turns out, the harshest contra-remonstrant polemic in the synopsis seems to come in the title. Now, what uh, one theologian has um, suggested is uh, my next topic here. The synopsis' famous moderation in tone from beginning to end is definitely commendable but it's not especially helpful for 
trying to identify the differences that are in question. If, in fact, the differences with and the polemic against remonstrance are not to be found by searching the index for remonstrant, a method I may have tried at the beginning of this, <laughs> then we must look more closely for ways in which the synopsis differs from previous iterations of Leiden cycles. Von Itterzon suggests a couple of ways in which the synopsis is distinctly reformed and by implication different from its rivals. And I refer to these as thematic differences. Whatever the suggested differences may be, we must compare the disputations from the previous Leiden cycles with their corresponding topics in the synopsis in order to see if the differences are real. So first, in an attempt to identify the features that distinguish the synopsis from pre-Dort disputations, consider how Van Interzone distinguishes the synopsis from its opponents. After noting its polemic against Roman Catholics, Socinians, Anabaptists, Remonstrants, Libertines, Lutherans, as well as more ancient schools of thought, Van Itterzon then declares that the synopsis is expressly reformed in character. Apparently, in contrast to its rivals, he further explains this, that the synopsis design is, quote, theological, not anthropological, end quote. As a reformed handbook of theology, every locus is aimed toward God's glory. As support for this claim of the centrality of God and the directing of all topics to God's glory, he proceeds in order through the synopsis and provides many illustrations. The following selections from various disputations are indicative. Von Ederzone cites the disputation on the nature of God and the divine attributes which opens by declaring that because God is the principium of theology, all other loci flow from the locus on God, which is why the whole endeavor is called theology. He points also to the disputation on creation, in which it is stated that God in creation reveals his glory and invites his creatures to the celebration of his name. Von Itterzone adds that, quote, above all, the reformed resisted all mixture of creator and creature and by this they stood up for the glory of God." End quote. Von Itterzone cites the disputation on the office of Christ, which states that the end goal of Christ's kingship is that the church will triumph with Christ and will glorify God without ceasing. Moving on to the penultimate disputation on the resurrection and judgment, Von Itterzone observes that the last judgment is a divine action that is accomplished for the glory of God's name and the eternal joy of the elect. Against von Itterzone's implicit suggestion that an emphasis on divine glory somehow sets the synopsis apart, two points may be offered. First, the earlier Leiden cycles of disputation are no less concerned than the synopsis with the centrality of God and the importance of divine glory. This point can be illustrated by comparing earlier disputations on the same topics. At, so I'm going through the same topics here. At the conclusion of a disputation on God's nature, Trocatius Jr. notes that the contemplation of the divine attributes leads to adoration of God. Arminius' disputation on the same topic observes that God is, quote, the object of religion, and that all things that are said about God must be enunciated, quote, in a holy manner and for God's glory. Neither of these disputations is as clear as that of Theseus in declaring that all low-key flow from the doctrine of God, but the centrality of divine worship and of God's glory is clear in the earlier cycles' treatments of God's nature. On the topic of creation, Humarus repeatedly declares that creation is for God's glory, the good of created nature, and the salvation of the elect. Trocatius Jr. later repeats the same point, that creation is for God's glory, the good of the universe, and the salvation of the elect. In disputations on the office of Christ, Homaris is clearer in the fourth repetition than in the third that the highest end of Christ's office is God's glory, and the subordinate end is our redemption, justification, sanctification, and salvation. Arminius' disputation on Christ's offices also considers God's glory. As prophet, he says, Christ proposed his teachings for the glory of God and salvation of humanity. Moreover, kings of the earth must continue to give all glory to Christ as their true spiritual king. On the topic of resurrection and the final judgment, Arminius states that it is for the glory of God's name and that the ultimate end is the glory of the justice and grace of God. 
The result of the eternal life to follow judgment is the glorious praise of God. And I've just limited myself in all of these to disputations that were actually in those cycles, not the ones that were quadrilibital or outside the cycles for the whole paper. It's clear based on these samples from the same disputation topics that there is no substantive difference of emphasis before and after Dort regarding the centrality of God and of God's glory. On the one hand, the exercise almost seems excessive, and the findings should not be surprising to anyone who has read any of the Leiden theologians prior to Dort. And when I say that, I realize of the living people who read disputations uh, in Leiden prior to Dort, probably half of us are here. But um, <coughs> on the other hand, it's instructive actually to do the comparison and see that this feature of the synopsis cannot be what makes it pure. Second, not only does Van Ederzone wrongly imply a difference between pre- and post dort language about God, but he also errs in confusing what is characteristically or commonly reformed with what is distinctly or uniquely reformed. For example, as cited above in his discussion of creation aiming toward God's glory, Van Ederzone writes, quote, above all, the reformed resisted all mixture of creator and creature, and by this they stood up for the glory of God, end quote. This claim is at the same time dubious and revealing. In the same way, the emphasis on the ultimate glory of God, though it may be characteristically reformed, is not uniquely reformed. If one wants to point to texts, as von Itterzon does, then it's worth noting that the word gloria appears about 210 times in Arminius's public and private disputations. I don't know how this frequency ratio compares with contemporary mainstream reformed divines, but this is not an insignificant number, as reflected also in the Jesuit motto, ad maiorum de gloriam. All Orthodox Christians intend for their faith and practice to point to God and to be for his glory. Claims about which theological system is more theocentric or anthropocentric should either be abandoned as assertions without arguments or else be demonstrated with something more than finding instances of the word glory. And if Van Itterson were the only person that does this, I probably wouldn't have brought it up. Thus, whereas we may acknowledge that the synopsis is theological, not anthropological, and that it is aimed toward the goal of God's glory, we must reject his assumption that it's thereby distinctly reformed. We must therefore keep looking for what actually makes the synopsis different or purer. So, moving on. Somewhat related to the last suggestion. Von Itterzone next states that, quote, the reformed character of the synopsis comes out further in the synthetic structure of the disputations, end quote. Once again, by pointing specifically to its reformed character, he implies a feature that distinguishes this handbook from non-reformed or pre-Dort counter counterparts. He explains that the motivation of the whole arrangement is not the salvation of humanity. On the contrary, he writes, the various loci are strongly theologically oriented, he then mentions the general order of the topics, from the nature of theology, to the principia of scripture and God, to God's essence, creation, and so on, all the way to final judgment. He also stresses, quote, the strong predestination-tinted treatment of the doctrines. A claim about the structure of the book and the order of the doctrines revealing a strong theological, that is, theocentric, organization is similar to the earlier claim, but now writ large. It's puzzling, though. For systematic theology's focus on God is as old as Christian systematic theology. And so this point about the theological order reflecting a reformed character can probably be dismissed. It does, however, raise an interesting question that he doesn't bring up about the order of topics in the synopsis in comparison with pre-Dort Leiden cycles. So I will raise it. Before Dort, each repetition of the cycle varied somewhat in length and content from the one that preceded it. The original cycle apparently had a total of 36 disputations. Then the first repetition was very long, 63 disputations. And the second, very short, 24. The third repetition, which was arranged by Junius, Trelcatius Sr., and Humaris, found the right balance, really hit the sweet spot on length and content. The number, order, and titles of the disputations varied little between the third and fifth repetitions. In comparison with the pre-Dort cycles, the number of disputations in the synopsis, which is 52, 
is on the higher end, but still close to the standard 47 represented in the fourth repetition. The topics in order are nearly the same as those treated in earlier cycles. Two exceptions stand out. First, in the three earlier Leiden cycles in which the disputation on resurrection and eternal life appears, it always follows directly after the topic of calling and directly precedes the topic of the Catholic Church. In other words, it concludes soteriology and then moves on to ecclesiology. In the synopsis, however, the one disputation has become two, one on resurrection and judgment and the other on the consummation of the age and eternal life. And they've been moved to the very end of the book, concluding the whole cycle. Though unprecedented in Leiden, these are also the final two topics in the printed collection of Geneva's disputation cycle. Another exception is the appearance in the synopsis of two disputations, one on the oath and the other on the Sabbath and the Lord's Day that are unprecedented at Leiden. In the earlier fifth repetition, there was a disputation each for the first table and then the second table of the law. Their order in the synopsis, following after disputations on God's law and on idolatry, suggests a correspondence to the first table of the Decalogue, though the second table is not addressed at all in the synopsis. In addition to the number, order, and topics, it's also worth pointing out that the disputations of the synopsis are considerably longer than almost every disputation that appeared in earlier cycles. With few exceptions, the earlier disputations fit on the recto and verso of four quarto leaves, the first of which was occupied with front matter. And they generally included approximately 15 theses, some more, some less. By contrast, the disputations of the synopsis typically exceed 50 theses. Having noted the only conspicuous differences in the topics and order of the disputations, we must conclude that the overall structure and organization of the topics, singled out by van Itterzon as distinctly reformed, do not in fact constitute a difference significant enough to account for the greater purity of the synopsis. In our search for that which makes the synopsis purer than or simply different from earlier Leiden disputation cycles, we must move on to examine and compare specific topics that we may predict would be contested. In fact, there are only two places that I know of in the synopsis that allude to the remonstrant co controversy. The disputation on predestination and the one on free choice. I'll comment briefly, I hope, on some disputations on predestination that appear in the Leiden cycles and then conduct a more thorough examination of disputations on free choice. First, the disputations on predestination would be the most obvious place to look for contrast before and after Dort. In the disputation cycles, the topic of predestination fell to all three faculty members. Arminius in third repetition, Trochaeus in the fourth, and Humarus in the fifth, which provides a good picture of the range of opinion and how that could be expressed in public disputations. So, Arminius' doctrine of predestination has been thoroughly examined elsewhere, so it's not necessary to lay out all the details here. Let it suffice to point out a few distinctive aspects that are evident in his brief disputation on the topic that would have been contested by his colleagues According to Arminius, predestination is God's decree to justify believers, and reprobation is the decree to condemn unbelievers. The foundation of the decree of election is Jesus Christ. The decree takes into account human sin, which is an infralapsarian position. Trochaeus' view ab about predestination, and particularly this question of where it, uh, the decree uh, is related to the fall, Depending on the divine perspective, the object of predestination for Trochaeus may be uh, man, and here are the options, considered as, quote, creatable, to be created, created, fallible, fallen, restored, and so on, end quote. Uh, after quoting a few of Trochaeus' theses, um, he doesn't include that one, but he includes some other ones, Arminius wrote that they are asserted wrongly, badly, and absurdly. All that to say, Arminius did not approve of Trochaeus on that. And Humarus' view was uh, clearly superlapsarian. Um, he does other disputations of predestination. The one in the fifth repetition, I will skip for now. 
It's uh, the one that I found that is longer, at least in the number of theses, than anything in the synopsis uh, that I recall. It's 124 theses long and one corollary. Um, <coughs> The synopsis on the disputation on predestination was uh, composed by Wallaeus. It begins nearly verbatim with Trucatius. Quote, predestination is arduous and full of difficulty. End quote. But it should be taught in the churches. Two main points I take uh, for, for our purposes here from its content. One, the material cause or object of election. This is the synopsis now. Quote, the matter from which God graciously elects certain ones is the human race, fallen from primitive integrity into sin by its own fault, and liable to condemnation, end quote. In its clear preference for infralapsarianism, the synopsis is quite different from Trocatius and especially Humarus. Two, without mentioning any names, Wallace describes a view held by many, quote, who wish to be members of the Reformed Church, end quote. He proceeds to describe and rebut what is taken to be the remonstrant view, namely that election is based on foreseen faith, which arises, quote, partly from the gift of God and partly from human free will. In sum, on predestination, the synopsis certainly differs with three of its predecessors, though more explicitly with Arminius than with Trocatius and Humarus. So enough on that. We say, okay, there's a big difference there. Free choice. Since Arminius called the topic of freedom from sin the chief controversy today, we'll trace the topic of free choice as it's treated in the various Leiden cycles and look for any development and later differences with the synopsis. So, in the third repetition, pre third repetition, the disputation on free choice fell to Humarus, who was the only living faculty member at this time in 1603. All the disputations fell to Humarus for a few months. Then. According to Humarus, following Augustine, free choice is a faculty both of the intellect and of the will. Although corrupt humanity may not be free from slavery to sin, there is freedom from coercion. Humarus takes pains to deny metaphysical determinism, claiming that neither the eternal decree of God nor the temperament of the person introduces any force into the will. He defines free choice as, quote, a faculty of the rational soul free from all coercion, which having followed the mind's judgment either chooses by reason of the good an object revealed by the intellect or refuses the object by reason of the evil or suspends both options, end quote. After defining free choice, Humarus, again following Augustine, considers the abilities of free choice under four distinct human conditions, three in this world, the state of innocence and integrity, the state of malice and corruption, and the state of grace and regeneration, and one in the world to come. Under the first state, Adam truly possessed free choice, and since he could have acted otherwise if he had willed, he was under no coercion or necessity to sin. When discussing the state of corruption, Homaris distinguishes three categories of action. One, natural actions pertain to animal life, such as eating and sleeping. Moral actions pertain to external obedience and conservation of the human race. Three, spiritual actions concern the spiritual life and true beatitude. In natural actions, common grace is granted and the natural aptitude of intellect and will is retained so that one can perform the duties necessary for sustaining natural life. In moral actions, God may grant to the unregenerate a special grace by which they may choose and perform externally moral actions. These externally good actions, however, cannot please God. Because these moral actions lack true faith and obedience and a desire for God's glory, they are not true virtues. In spiritual matters, unregenerate humanity can clearly do nothing. Quote, For although he has free choice so that he acts, nevertheless he does not have freed choice so that he acts well. And so he is from himself inept for the good, so that he necessarily works evil." End quote. After the fall, the intellect does not understand spiritual things, and the will does not will them. Roman Catholics shamefully err, therefore, when they say that free choice in spiritual things has simply been weakened, and that the unregenerate person is only half-dead, 
a point that they based on the venerable allegorical interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, an interpretation and conclusion that Humarus rejects. In the state of regeneration, conversion is effected by God alone, making an unwilling person into, an, into a willing person. The faculty of choice is mixed, partly to good and partly to evil. This is quote, by the way. So, um, <coughs> Humara stresses that, quote, the free choice of the regenerate person is carried to evil because the intellect knows the good in part only, but the will is still inclined to evil things, end quote. Humarus concludes with a brief description of free choice in the final age when the free choice of the damned will be immutably for evil and the choice of the blessed will be immutably, immutably toward the good. Two years later, in 1605, during the fourth repetition, Arminius handled the disputation on free choice. Arminius defines free choice primarily as a faculty of the intellect, and like Humarus, he notes that it is transferred also to the will. He distinguishes Three categories of good things to which choice may be directed. One, natural things, which humanity has in common with other creatures. Two, animal things, which belong to humans in particular. And three, spiritual things, also called heavenly or divine, are things consistent with being participants in the divine nature. These categories correspond to Hamar's three types of good actions, natural, moral, and spiritual. Arminius also treats the freedom from sin under three human conditions in this life. Primitive integrity, subsequent corruption, and renewed righteousness. He does not go on to discuss the final state of beatitude. Arminius specifies that the topic for his disputation is not whether one can do natural and animal good, but the question he wishes to address regards freedom from sin and the ability to do spiritual good. As he comes to the second state of corruption, Arminius spends much ink stressing that, after the fall, the will to good is absolutely useless, unless it is helped by grace. The mind is darkened, and so the affections of the heart are perverted, causing fallen humanity to love and pursue what is evil. The fallen person's entire life is dead in sins. In the state of renewed righteousness, the beginning, the progress, and the perseverance in the good all come from God through the Holy Spirit. An initial comparison between Humarus and Arminius can be made based on their entries on free choice in the third and fourth repetitions, respectively. Overall, Arminius' disputation on free choice is standard fare for a Reformed theologian, and it is, on many points, in complete agreement with Humarus' earlier disputation. At the same time, a closer look may reveal some subtle differences. Because Arminius admits that well, I'll just talk about some silence first. And we can talk about the silence only because we know his views more fully elsewhere in his writings. First, because Arminius excludes discussion of free choice in natural and animal good and skips right to the question about spiritual good, he's able to avoid the thorny question about the status of those externally good actions that Humarus claimed are not pleasing to God and not true virtues. Another point of silence that may be significant is that Arminius does not emphasize, as Humarus does, that God changes the will of the elect who were unwilling. However, it's not in the silence only, but especially in the positive statements of Arminius that other differences with Humarus can be perceived. These differences come not in his discussion of the second state of corruption, but rather in the discussion of the third state of renewed righteousness. First of all, with regard to conversion to the third state, Arminius concludes his disputation text with quotations from two of Reformed theology's favorite doctors. Augustine and Bernard. The excerpt from Augustine highlights the necessity of preceding grace, and the remarks from Bernard indicate that free choice both is saved and saves. With these quotations, Arminius emphasizes indirectly the harmony of God's grace with human freedom in receiving salvation. Second, there are different emphases on the kind of life expected and lived in the third state, that is, the life of sanctification. When Humarus introduces the third state, he immediately describes choice as mixed, directed partly to good and partly to evil. After noting that conversion comes from God alone, again, the first thing he says about choice in the third regenerate state is that it is carried to evil, and that the will is still inclined to evil things. Although the regenerate are justified by Christ's merit in this life, perfection comes only in the next life. Humarus' account of the Catholic 
view, uh, Roman Catholic view of the unregenerate, in which free choice is described as not destroyed, but as weakened and half dead, bears a striking resemblance to his own description of the regenerate, still carried to evil and inclined to evil. So just the, the striking to me the similarity of his description of the Roman Catholic view of the unregenerate and his description of the regenerate. The difference in Arminius' treatment of the third state is evident in his opening line on this point. After discussing the very negative situation of the state of corruption, Arminius writes, quote, but far different is the consideration of the free choice of humanity con constituted in the third state. Arminius' emphasis is reflected in what he names the third state. Comaris calls it the state of regeneration. Arminius calls it the state of renewed righteousness. Rather than simply noting that the regenerate are justified now and perfected in the next life, as did Humarus, Arminius instead claims that, quote, the work of regeneration and illumination is not perfected in one moment, but by daily increments is advanced and promoted, end quote. Sin is present in the life of the regenerate, but there is a real battle between the flesh and the spirit, not indicated, really, in Humarus. Both Chamaris and Arminius acknowledge that conversion comes from God, that sanctification is a cooperative process, and that perfection is not achieved in this life. But whereas Chamaris seems at home discussing the evil that the regenerate still do, Arminius' impulse is to underscore the positive call to holiness. Chamaris retains a comparatively negative, and Arminius a comparatively positive, though chastened, view of the life of sanctification under the third state. Third, there's a difference in the treatment of the consequences of sin in the regenerate. Chamaris repeatedly acknowledges that the regenerate will sin, but he does not discuss its consequences or the doctrine of perseverance. Arminius' disputation, on the other hand, mentions that, quote, if those who are reborn fall into sins, they neither repent nor rise again unless they are raised up again and renewed to repentance by God through the power of his spirit, end quote. It's not explicit, but this sentence does hint at the grave consequences of sin and perhaps the possibility of apostasy, a doctrine that Arminius clarifies elsewhere. Okay, so those are the first two. In the fifth repetition, 16.7, the topic of free choice fell again to Humaris, and it's instructive to compare this disputation with his earlier one and with the one by Arminius that fell between them. Here, Humaris abandons the typical outline of the three states of human choice in this life, though the categories remain implicit. After a brief definition of free choice in the opening thesis, Humaris immediately launches into the controversy, questioning what a non-reborn person can do with regard to spiritual good. He asks whether the unregenerate, by a certain internal first principle and by his own powers, can will or choose a truly spiritual good. He answers in the negative, quote, Corrupt and non-reborn humanity can will or choose nothing of spiritual good by his own powers, end quote. What, what took 15 theses to arrive at in his previous disputation in 16.3, Chamaris now answers already in the second thesis. He proceeds to prove this uh, thesis by an array of scriptures that he classifies into five categories. After these references, he concludes once again that for the unregenerate, quote, whatever he is able to will, or wills to choose, or does choose, it only is sin, either simply from itself or from accident, end quote. By sin, ex accidente, humaris means externally neutral or good actions that are not done from faith or for God's glory. In other words, humaris does not hesitate to call even the best works of the unregenerate sin. As to the beginning of the state of regeneration, Humaris emphatically denies that a person can, by his own ability and will and power, consent to the divine calling. Progress in the state of regeneration is only accomplished by God's will, and Humaris continues to stress human inability, corruption, and an inclination to evil. So the subtle differences between Humaris' first disputation on free choice and Arminius on the same have more to do with a few details of content than in structure. The differences between Humaris' two disputations the one before and after Arminius, have more to do with structure than with details of content. To be sure, in his second disputation, Humaris merely strengthened some of his own points that Arminius did not address, as well as other points concerning which he may have perceived Arminius' positions to be inadequate. But it's striking that only in this latter disputation 
Structurally speaking, Humaris leaps over the typical introductory discussions about free choice, neglecting the categories that would contextualize the controversy, and instead rushes straight into the contested questions. In the 16.3 disputation, as well as on a quadlibital disputation back in 16.2, Humaris exhibits a sort of patience for the preliminary questions that he does not have now in 16.7. I don't know whether Ahamaras was using this disputation as an opportunity to respond to Arminius' disputation from two years earlier, but I suspect he might have been. He had done this before in 16.4, using a disputation on predestination to counter one from Arminius eight months before, that time out of outside of the cycle. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, I'll, I'll be briefer than I would have been on um, the synopsis because I noticed that I think Mark is doing on free choice on the synopsis um, tomorrow and for the sake of time as well. But um, let me see if I can sum up um, some of this on the synopsis um, quickly. Um, Basically, it's in agreement. It goes through and, and, and uses those four categories of uh, free choice um, in the, the various states. Also, the three uh, corresponding uh, objects and, and corresponding actions directed to them calls them the biological or natural, then the civil or philosophical, and the spiritual goods. Uh, same three categories. Nobody can seem to agree on what to call the second one, but it's it's really the same thing. Um, in agreement with Humaris and Arminius, corrupt humanity is said to have the power to do some natural good, first category, some civic or philosophical good, but no spiritual good. Um, it emphasizes, like Humaris does, but like Arminius omitted, that the external results of an action may be good, but the action itself is still rendered as sin. Um, and no human cooperation in conversion. Um, in points where Humaris and Arminius seem to differ with one another in their disputations on free choice, the synopsis sides with Humaris. The indefatigable emphasis that Humaris places on the regenerate person's inclination to evil, I think, is dialed back slightly in the synopsis, which seems to leave a somewhat more positive role for sanctification, though it still falls short of the optimism that Arminius maintains for sanctification in the third state of regeneration, in what he calls renewed righteousness. So it certainly differs from Arminius, but the disagreement is less stark than that between Humaris and Arminius. Apart from the disputation on predestination, the topic of free choice was perhaps the most contested topic of the Arminian and Remonstrant debate represented in the synopsis. As a pure theology, one might expect clear differences with the disputation cycles that preceded it, but such is not the case. The differences are not highlighted or pursued, and neither Arminius nor the Remonstrants are mentioned by name. As noted earlier, however, the closing, closing theses of this disputation do mention the opinions rejected at Dort, referring to what the synopsis there calls the semi-Pelagian error, namely that free choice is weakened but not corrupt, and that conversion is due partly to grace and partly to free choice. If this post-Dort Leiden theology is pure in comparison with the corresponding disputation cycles before Dort, then Arminius must be the target here. As we've seen, though, this description of fallen free choice does not apply to Arminius' disputation, which expressly calls the fallen condition the state of corruption. It also does not apply to Arminius' discussion of conversion, whose disputation never said that conversion is due partly to grace and partly to free choice. After this comparison of four disputations on free choice, what conclusions can be drawn about the content and any significant differences or increased purity in the synopsis. The substantive differences that may be found between Arminius and the synopsis are few and far between. One must search in the most obvious places in the disputations on free choice and on predestination to find those substantive dis differences, and even then they are not immediately obvious. In the disputations on free choice, the differences are subtle, and it takes a trained eye that knows the context and what to expect in order to detect the differences, which are in many cases matters of emphasis. The vast majority of the content in the synopsis is consistent with pre-Dort Leiden disputations, whether by Humaris, Trelcatius, or Arminius. I've not demonstrated this claim, but um, 
because it would be less interesting to go through maybe the 40-something disputations where they say basically the same thing. That should be done at some point, but uh, we're going to run out of time. So, given the reasonable expectations set by the book's own title and its preface, that the synopsis would be a plain alternative to remonstrant theology, and specifically to the kind of theology taught at Leiden before Dort, one may justifiably be surprised by the lack of clear contrasts throughout the work. We are reluctant to accuse synopsis of false advertising, but we can at least observe that the disputations, for the most part, are not much different in content from the earlier cycles. In the two places where there is contra-remonstrant polemic, the polemic is faint and elusive. In those places, the synopsis does not seem to be concerned with any specific passages from Arminius disputations or with the previous cycles in general. Who or what then is the perceived opponent? Arminius could be in view. In some respects, his influence was more widespread than it was during his life due to the posthumous publication of his disputations and his other works, as well as the Syntagma of 1615. However, because his disputations are not directly addressed in the synopsis, the primary opponent on the topics of predestination and free choice is not a specific individual or a specific group of writings, but remonstrant theology in general, which itself is not a monolithic entity. It is the entire shadow of Arminius, Forstius, and Episcopius and their sympathizers that the synopsis intends to dispel. In light of this comparison of disputations, an additional word may be useful about the nature of disputations that may help explain why the differences are only subtle. As an outline that tended to follow a scholastic method of inquiry with a limited scope and with limited space, a disputation could say much and also leave much unsaid. It's not that they are inaccurate reflections of the author's thought. They are simply abbreviated reflections, especially when the content was intended to fit on three quarto leaves. As far as the brief outlines go, Arminius was Protestant enough and perhaps even Reformed enough to be consistent with most of the content of the synopsis. So a final point sort of about, yeah, about faculty cooperation. A general consensus exists that one of the outstanding features of the faculty that produce the synopsis is their doctrinal harmony with one another. This harmony is mentioned by the authors themselves in the preface. It's a passage written uh, in a passage written by Wallea's son and quoted by many subsequent studies. The agreement among the professors is noted, as well as the fact that the professors would not defend any thesis publicly without the prior approval of the other faculty members. Bobink points out that the four new Leiden professors, quote, were in remarkable agreement among themselves, end quote. Such harmony constitutes a clear point of contrast with pre-Dort Leiden faculty. For the better part of 15 years, from 1603 to 1618, the Leiden faculty was plagued by disunity, first between Arminius and Clamaris, and somewhat trochaceous, and later between Episcopius and Polyander. To be sure, during Arminius' tenure, there were times of cooperation and collegiality. Clamaris, Arminius, and Trochaceous came together to carry out the work of the Theological College, including their determination of topics for the fourth and fifth repetitions. In 1605, in response to reports about dissent among the faculty, the three faculty members and the regent of the Theological College came together and signed a statement of solidarity saying, quote, they knew not of any difference among the professors of the faculty of theology so far as related to fundamental points of doctrine, end quote. The whole truth, however, is that the working relationships were often tense and the doctrinal disagreements were on display. At the very least, during this time, the completed and gathered cycles would not make for a very harmonious theology, but might lack the coherency, either from cycle to cycle or within any particular cycle itself that would be desired. Depending on which professor happened to be assigned the topic of free choice or predestination, the particular content of the Leiden theology could vary from one cycle to the next. During the time of Episcopius and Polyander, the curators were aware of and actually wanted the differences of opinion to be represented on the faculty, hoping for peace in the midst of those differences. This is the first known case of administrators in higher education, education enforcing diversity. Okay, Whew, tough. <laughs> it's time to wrap up, okay. Uh, although there was minimal strife, there was no attempt in uh, the 1610s 
to carry on or to publish a cooperative disputation cycle. In the wake of Dort, the curators understandably desired unity in the theological faculty. Thus, a faculty was formed in which there was true cooperation and harmony even on the controverted issues. It's this spirit of cooperation and harmony, absent for 15 years at Leiden, that constitutes the primary difference between the pre- and post-Dort situation at Leiden. So, just to wrap up uh, before we move to um, questions, if there are any, we've asked the question that's implied in the title of the book, Synopsis of Pure Theology. Namely, what is pure about the synopsis and how much pure is it? Based on the preface to the book and the context uh, of the disputation, especially the time and place, the book intends a comparison especially with the theology that emanated from Leiden before the Synod of Dort. Therefore, in order to understand what exactly is purer about the synopsis, we suggested a comparative study between the Leiden disputation cycles before Dort and the post-Dort synopsis. Von Itterzone strongly implies that the difference lies in the synopsis' distinctly reformed emphasis on God and God's glory. But our comparative study reveals that there is no difference. For by Van Itterzone's criteria, the, the pre-Dort disputations, and not least those of Arminius, are theocentric. Von Itterzone also suggests a uniquely reformed theological structure to the topics and arrangement of the synopsis. On the contrary, the comparison shows that there is no significant difference in the content and order. Since there are no obvious thematic differences, I suggested a look at individual topics, beginning with the only two topics that polemicize against remonstrance, predestination and free choice. And they polemicize only faintly. On predestination and free choice, there are differences between the synopsis and the pre-Dort disputations, but no more, and probably less than the disagreements within the pre-Dort faculty itself. Aside from these topics, and perhaps on calling and on justifying faith, there's little or no substantive difference in the individual topics that would warrant the title of purer. It may be that those few topics alone are enough to warrant the title uh, purer. This implies then that there was something of purity before Dort, perhaps half-dead sparks of purity, <laughs> and that a few weeds do not render the whole thing totally impure. Whatever was taught in Leiden before Dort by Arminius and Episcopius, by way of disputation or otherwise, it was not Roman Catholicism, Socinianism, Anabaptism, or Libertinism. Along with the numerous and deep similarities between Arminius' thought and that of his Reformed contemporaries, there are enough real differences in Arminius' thought to explore without having to concoct new ones that really aren't there. In addition to a few specific topics, what we've found to be pure and the most obvious difference is the doctrinal harmony of the new Leiden faculty and of its entire disputation cycle. So when Homarus writes a chapter on free choice and Arminius writes the one on predestination, which happened in the third repetition, or when Arminius writes on free choice and Trelcatius on predestination, which happened in the fourth repetition, the theological handbook that is produced, though intriguing, is not especially coherent and not particularly helpful, perhaps, for students or pastors who wanted the right answers. The synopsis, by contrast, because of its unified voice in accordance with the three forms of unity, was different and purer. Through its multiple printing, uh, in its multiple printings, it was able to serve generations of Reformed students. So, the last word, the short answer to the question, how much purer is the synopsis? If by pure we mean different, a little. Thanks. So. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we can open up the floor to some questions, and I'll be happy to pass a mic around. Thanks for your lecture. Um, the question that popped to my mind as you half-jokingly talked about false advertising was, what would be the role in the publisher in maybe giving the title to the lecture such that uh, it, it might just sell more if you say purer, right? right. Um, even though there's no good scientific reason to call it purer. 
Um, yeah. Do, do you know anything about that, the uh, title, giving of the title? and? I don't know which came first, the title or the preface, but the pref in, in the preface, the authors, it's just attributed to the four authors, okay. talk about this being a pure theology, I, I, and talk about the title, synopsis of pure theology. Okay. So if they did, I'm sure it was in consultation with the publishers. I mean, it seems to come from them. Okay, yeah. yeah. But part of that whole context, you know, and, every, and everything I mentioned here, it's, it's more in the promotion of it, and this is something new, because it's unified and it's not going to be the same sort of divisions in this very important theological faculty that it had been before Dort. I'm Don Cinema. Uh, a couple of times you mentioned Brandt's comment about Gomaras doing that disputation on predestination out of order, outside the, s the cycle. Uh, given the fact that not only were there cycles, but uh, quite a bit of frequency of random or quadribital uh, uh, dis uh, disputations, uh, is it really unfair, is it really fair of Brandt to say it's, it was uh, out of order for Gomaras to do that disputation on predestination? Because I take that to be simply a random disputation along with many other random dis disputations that were done that same year. Now, it's clearly addressed against Arminius, but that particular criticism that it was out of order, I have a question about. Right. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, of course, Brandt um, is a sympathizer of Arminius, so he's going to emphasize that, that part of it. Um, I don't think he's saying, in, in saying that, that it was um, impermissible or unusual for Hamaris to do a random disputation. It's the, the content of it in that everyone there, Arminius being present as well, and I'm not, I'm not sure, I forget who talks about this, but Arminius, they all realized this is against the one Arminius just did eight months earlier. And that, I mean, that whole instance in 16.4, six, the fall of 16.3, Arminius uh, begin, and Trocatius begin their duties presiding over disputations, teaching the lectures, and so forth. For just a few months there, things seem to be going well. And then the uh, topic comes to Arminius on predestination in February of 16.4. And you can see that's when, and Humaris later talks about, I thought we were good, you know, when Arminius uh, disputed on justification back in, you know, 16.3. I thought things were going to uh, be good here. And then that disputation that Arminius did on predestination really sort of opened the floodgates of um, controversy among the faculty. So I think what Brandt's really getting at there is that not, not just that he did a disputation out of the, the cycle that happened all the time, as we say, um, but that he um, did it clearly to respond to Arminius. Later on, he does, I mean, free choice, he does wait. Uh, it, like I say, his 16-7 disputation on free choice really sounds, it seems like, the, because it's so different from the others and he launches right into the contested questions, almost seems like the same sort of thing, a response to Arminius. But this time he waited till it was his turn. <laughs> he was patient, you know, two years later. Um, maybe he was uh, sensitive to the uh, uh, criticisms of going after him back in 16-4. I don't know. It seems to me also that eight months is a belated response. It wasn't as if he jumped on it right away. Right, yeah, and I don't know how many other quadlibital disputations uh, offhand would come between February and October that Comaris did. Of course, it's going to take not only writing it up, but having a student who's along in the process to do it. So I don't know enough to say whether it was soon or, or late or if that was him being patient, you know? Somebody talked him out of May or something, I don't know. <laughs> My name is Cedric Parcells. Um, <coughs> my, my question is, a lot of your argument rests on 
the the interpretation of the theologies that are that are present in the in the synopsis and in the in the earlier uh, disputations in the comparison of them. And you mentioned that the fact that there was this change in context uh, with the change of, of the professors. Could it be that the purity of it, and maybe this is what you were trying to suggest, maybe the purity of it isn't so much in what is said, but as, in, as is what is implied or assumed on the part of the reader when they pick up the synopsis. So there might not be anything explicitly anti remonstrant but it could be that when a person picks up this text, they are to have this background information that is going to uh, close down the spectrum of interpretation that will help them to, as it were, move easy more easily into the correct path. Yeah, I, d I don't mean to be saying anything different from that, I think, uh, or inconsistent with that. I think that's another way of, of putting what I'm saying here. So that, yeah, there's a, a sort of um, um, emotional comfort to people who've been worried about what's happening at Leiden for the, you know, the decades leading up to Dort that have really shaken the country in many ways. And now we have, you know, uh-oh, here's theology from Leiden again, <laughs> you know. Oh, well this is something we can put some confidence in. This is something we can give to our students without having to say, now which uh, disputation here is something you gotta watch out for and yeah. So there's uh, certainly a comfort and in, 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 in confidence in, in having it, even if the most of the content is similar to what would have come before. But that's, that's the question that I'm asking is, is the question is with the, um, with the, so you open a text, right? And you read something that might be on the page in terms of the actual words that are used, similar to something that had come before. But because of the change in background, you can always say, well, whatever it means, it can't mean that, right? Yeah. And so um, there's, there's a sense in which uh, more is imp implied, I think, in terms of being, um, I'm, maybe I'm just repeating myself, but yeah. you see what I'm saying there? I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, the content And I think changed. I'm in agreement with you. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you don't have to, th nobody's worrying about what Arminius really means when he says that. Nobody has to worry about what Wallaeus really means when he says such and such. You know. And all that's because there's a confidence there, so you're not having to read with the, the critical or skeptical eye that would have been characteristic before that. Good, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jordan Baller. Thanks for that, that fine talk. How much explicit reference is there to the canons as a kind of uh, um, a standard of purity? Explicit reference? Or, I mean, well, explicit and or material reference. Or how much of a, uh, speaking of a relevant background, how much of it? of that, is that the standard of purity that, that we're talking about or is, is in the background? Or and if so, to what extent? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, were you is it a I filter, is, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. I think background in the background is a good way to put it. It's um, explicitly mentioned in the preface and then again in the disputation on free choice at the end there. Um, always in a positive light, of course. But then, like on predestination, it's, um, implied when it rejects the remonstrant views um, that were rejected at Dort. So yes, more often you're going to see the um, implied references to and consistency with Dort on those controverted issues. I don't know that Dort comes up on the majority of the disputations even implicitly. is Dolph de Velde. I come from the Netherlands and I'm one of the contributors and one of the editors of uh, this uh, nice uh, edition. Um, thank you very much for your clear and helpful presentation. 
I'm happy to hear that uh, what we have researched is now becoming common knowledge uh, by your presentation. Uh, so thank you. Um, my question continues on, on the questions you uh, posed about uh, uh, historical context, but my question just takes the, the, the other side of this uh, problem. Um, this is a question of historical methodo methodology. Um, we try to approach the, the differences between uh, pre-Dort and post-Dort uh, Leiden disputations, but we do this with um, the, the decisions of the Senate in view. We, we know already um, how it escalated, but how can we um, use this knowledge to analyze what took place in the earlier disputations? Um, I think we, we should uh, do justice to the fact that the disputations are an academic um, form of, 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 of arguing, mm -hmm. uh, and in the uh, different cycles and repetitions uh, of disputations, we see an, an academic theological discourse in development. So we should not take our knowledge from behind and try to import it in, in the arguments and distinctions that were developed uh, earlier. Yeah, I think I agree with what you're saying there. And another way to put the question, um, you mentioned the private disputations in the time of Arminius. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything of the of private disputations in the in the period after Dort? Was it a practice that continued? I don't know. I would I would assume so, but I. I There's also an, an sure. interesting feature uh, that of the first cycle started by Unius, there were five repetitions. You mentioned uh, five repetitions, mm -hmm. and some of these were, were printed. When it comes to the synopsis, uh, there were also repetitions that were exercised mm -hmm. in practice, but these repetitions were never printed. It was only subsequent editions of the synopsis, but the, mm -hmm. the text remained basically the same. What would th that mean for the status, status of the disputations um, that were published in 1625. What does that mean for the stata? The, the yeah. fact that the subsequent cycles were not published? The of the synopsis disputations, there um, are individual printed uh, repetitions which differ in text and content from the synopsis edition, mm -hmm. but these repetitions were never printed. So it seems that they did not, did not acquire the same official status as a standard text. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, um, or maybe the nature of the question, but what comes to mind is since they have established that this is the pure theology and the um, subsequent repetitions are still done by the same professors for a little while, then people die, whatever, you know, are replaced and so forth. Um, I think I understand correctly that the, in most cases the content, I mean the uh, order of the topics um, stayed the same for a little while there. So, I mean, they could, I suppose, publish those too. It's not that they weren't important for their own context. Again, the immediate context of all this is the classroom. It is for the uh, training of ministers in the seminary. Um, but if they do another edition, I mean a complete other book, why replace something that's already pure if it's there? Are they going to call it synopsis of pure theology too? Or, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't think it, it renders the task obsolete after that I as, a, as an exercise. I guess I'm, I'm more uh, also um, interested in your historiographical question. Do you think that there's um, some sort of anachronism in the comparison of the disputations before and after Dort? I just wasn't sure, maybe on your first question, how you were, where you were going with that. I can only give a tentative an answer. I've tried to research uh, differences between Arminius' doctrine of God and the doctrine of God in the synopsis. So my point with the um, historical historiographic uh, 
point of view is that um, reformed scholastic theology as reflected in the disputations is a theology in search of the truth and in search of the right distinctions, definitions, arguments uh, to explain the truth. Um, then uh, the theology professors um, find some, some structures and, and uh, term, terms of, of, of arguing, arguing, and it is not immediately clear uh, what the consequences will be. So uh, in, in, f in the case of Arminius, um, it is hard to notice any differences between his doctrine of God and the standard orthodox doctrine of God. But in my analysis, there was a, um, a slight but important difference in that he um, discusses, uh, on the one hand, the essence of God, the essential uh, attributes of God, and in the next stage he uh, discusses the, the life of God, the Vita Dei. Mm -hmm. And in discussing the Vita Dei, uh, Arminius gives more room to the, the world outside of God um, in order to, to sort of influence or occasion the actions of God. Okay. So that that's a, yeah, a structural difference. It is a very slight difference. Yeah. I guess I'd have to think more about how that how Dort uh, would affect that. Um, it doesn't directly affect Dort, but okay. in the structures of theology, the deeper structures. Okay. But you no, do not see it immediately. You only see it when it develops yeah. ten or fifteen years okay. further. Don Cinema again. I find it very interesting that in that period between Arminius's death in 1609 and the Synod of Dort 1618, you've got about a decade there where there are no formal cycles of disputations in the theology department. Yeah. Uh, it's partly because of the polemics and so on. Um, it's also partly because of the understaffed department. You know, at, at there was a six month period for example, when there were no professors and otherwise two professors. You have published uh, a number of disputations of Episcopius after, th after the fact, but they're not a, f a formal cycle, even though you sort of look at them and they, they look sort of like a cycle, but at the time they were not a formal cycle. Same thing with uh, Polyander. A uh, group of his disputations were later published, not a formal cycle. So mm -hmm. you don't, y you basically have uh, just random disputations in that whole, that whole decade. Um, there is also one exception, and that's Festus Homius, Homius yeah. yeah, who's who's not in the department, of course. He's he's pastor in Leiden. Right. Um, he is asked by the students, some of the students to offer some instruction, and so he's, he actually does a kind of a it's cycle a of disputation, yeah. disputations on the Heidelberg Catechism, right. and then a little later uh, on uh, against uh, the Catholic teaching of uh, Bellarmine, and that gets right. published in 1614. Um, part, of part of his reason for doing that was not just because the students uh, asked for it, but because Episcopius was an Arminian, and at the Staten College, um, Bertius, regent of the Staten College Arminians, are, uh, so, so he's doing this kind of to oppose mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in the university, in other words, but what he's doing is, is strictly private. I mean, he does it out of his home. Um, these are private disputations. Right. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering how that whole pattern in that decade might affect your analysis. Um, well, th I mean, it, it affected it simply because, at least as far as cycles go, there was nothing to really look at there. Um, I did check, I mean, what would be very interesting to me is to compare Episcopius, specifically his disputations on these same topics. You may notice I didn't mention him at all. Um, in his opera, at least, he's got nothing there on predestination or on free choice. 
Um, so there was nothing to look at. Of course, he could look at his institutions and see what he thinks about those things. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that's why I went to the cycles themselves, which ended in 16.9 before Episcopus. In answer to a question that came up on whether or not the, the uh, um, private disputations continued, uh, I looked at, in my research uh, for the dissertation, um, I looked at uh, a later period of Leiden from about 1685 through about 1780. And uh, at if, you, if you look very closely to the uh, rosters and posters that announce the order of lectures that would occur, there's a, little, there's a line on almost all of them, as I've seen them in the archives. There's a line at the bottom of all of them that says private disputations will be given um, at the request of students with the professor. So that, that it at least is not signaling in the university life that, that it's happening, but it, I have no record because they're not university documents as to whether or not we have any <coughs> remains of them. But uh, that it's occurring is very clear um, from, the, from the university catalogs and life. Just on that point, uh, tomorrow morning I'm going to be talking about Ames. So right after the Synod of Dort, Ames was actually doing private disputations, uh, if not in Leiden, certainly in Kronecker. And just sort of related to that point, um, Arminius private disputations, uh, I don't know how public those were or where people got a hold of them, but it was interesting that in one of the tracks from 16.9 or 10, Comaris is um, attacking Arminius's view, this is right after Arminius died, but referring to the private disputations. And I think this was before their publication, so 16.9, so I don't know where those were floating around and he had them. But <laughs> Why don't we thank our speaker? Thanks. Just by way of reminder, uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. we have a panel discussion. Uh, we have another one at 11, um, and then we have our plenary speaker at 11. Then we have another panel discussion at 2 p.m., and then a our final plenary discussion tomorrow afternoon at 3.30. So that's the schedule as it occurs on the back. If you would like, you're more than welcome to leave your name tag just outside, and we will collect those and redistribute them as, as you have need. So um, thank you. <laughs>